Today we're going to talk a little bit about chainsaw maintenance and also about probably the most challenging issue about having and using a chainsaw, how you sharpen the chainsaw blade. So, this is a chainsaw for the, the absolute beginners. Uh, it's a still 290M, M290. Um, it's considered to be about a medium size. This is a 20 inch bar and you measure the bar from the tip to the housing. First thing, of course, is remove the bolts and in your chainsaw box extra bolts are something you absolutely have to have because as soon as you try to take your saw apart someplace that's not a concrete floor you will lose a bolt and using a saw with one bolt is just not a good idea so you can see that the inside of, of the housing has, has been uh, plugged up and we will clean that in a second. You also see that the sprocket and the oiler housing um, on the saw are also pretty dirty. This is what you really have to get clean because the saw that's not being oiled is a saw that's not working very well. So, release the bar, release the blade, and let's start with the, the housing. Now, the reason it builds up in here. First of all, you see the irregular shapes, but remember there's large quantity of oil pouring through the blade on uh, the oiler ports on the blade onto the blade itself. So, job one, done. Job two here, again, we're just trying to get everything away from particularly this area. This area right here is where the oil pools before it leads into the, uh, you know, onto the chainsaw blade itself. So this needs to be all neat and cleaned up, ready to go on. Now, about the chain. If you're going to put the chain aside to be sharpened, again, a marble mystery oil is a, is a good thing to get the the, um, the organics off of the links, but also to clean the, the grit out of the links themselves. Um, so I, what I have is just a, well, a half gallon plastic jar with maybe two inches of marble mystery oil on the bottom. I drop the chain in and let it sit for 24 hours. And when it comes out, it's all bright and shiny. The bar mostly just kind of holds things still. The, things, the oral oil comes out of the, the oiler port and passes onto the chain through these two holes. Okay. And if that gets plugged up, your chain doesn't have oil and suddenly you've got a smoking chain that's not, not cutting very well. So making sure to clean the oiler ports, clean the interior, just because it's going to sit better back onto the, onto the saw bed. Stuff will tend to aggregate down in the bar. So I just take one of your screwdrivers and clean that off. If you have one of these old timers, and I wish they still made them, because I really do like them, the roller matic. That means that your, your chain roller is actually in a separate unit. And they have grease zerks, which means you can, can lubricate your chain. It's always a good idea to do that. And that's accomplished with one of these, a little portable grease zerk. Just put it in that hole. And you can see the grease gets forced down into the roller to lubricate the action of the roller bearing. Um, even though my the chain that I the chainsaw that I use most of the time um, doesn't have one of those, it you can still put the grease between the points and spin it to lubricate the bearing. Not a bad idea. The last thing on the bar, every time you take the chain off, flip the bar. And the reason you do that is to keep the groove wearing evenly. If your chain 
is always in the position, let's say with the steel up, then the wear is always going to be here. This is the, the point where the greatest tension is on the bar, right at the tip. If you rotate that every now and then, you wear the chain more evenly and extend the, the life of the equipment. The other thing that you need to do as a maintenance item, but it's not an every time thing, is don't forget you've got a fuel filter. To replace the filter, just hemostats, forceps, coat hanger, grab the fuel line, pull it out, pop that off, put the new one right back in, and you're good for another year. Items on fuel. If you're not going to use your saw for 30 days, it's a good idea to drain the gas out of it. As soon as we start our chainsaw, the first thing we want to do is gun it. That's not a good idea. Uh, the oil in the gas has not quite covered all the surfaces in the combustion chamber yet. So once the saw starts, let it cough and run for a little while. Let the, the, the oil make its way into the uh, combustion chamber. And then you can, uh, then you can speed up the... the uh, Speed up the saw and get to cutting. As so I said, don't forget, buy some extra nuts. I carry 10 of them with me. Or I start out with 10, I think I'm down to eight now. Um, make sure you have the appropriate uh, wrenches for your saw. And the only other thing I can recommend is this little natural bristle brush. So we got the, the classic kink in the, the saw chain. So how do you get it out? What you have to do is get the chain on the same side of the loops. And the easiest way to do that is just sort of going back and forth. And you see now, we have the chain on both sides of the loops. You just pull it up. Once you take the chainsaw chain off the chainsaw, you eventually have to put it back on. I have found over the years that a pair of gloves will make that a whole lot easier. Uh, it's not necessary, but then a good idea isn't always necessary. Make sure you got your, your um, teeth going the, the, the correct direction. We're going to put it on with the steel upside down. And I find that if, once I've got it in place, if I just hold it right like that, then I can put it over the sprocket. Drop the bar into the hole and wind it down enough to, to get the chain back in place. There we go. From here, again, not letting, not letting loose the chain on that end, and positioning the back on. There we go. This is where you drop the nuts into the brush. And unless you've got a magnetic wand, you're not going to find them. So get back to the box, get your spares. Tighten the back one first because we need to, to move, need the chain to be able to move a little bit. And use the screw to add tension to the chain again. First question, how tight do you want to tighten the chain? Well, keep in mind that 
as soon as you start it, it's going to get hot and it's going to stretch when it does that. Um, a good rule of thumb is to tighten the chain so that you can pretty easily pull it out to expose the holes in the tank and it'll snap back pretty easily. Keep in mind that once you start to use your saw, your, your chain is expanding all the time. Uh, and if you don't stop and tighten it up, it's going to come off and that could end badly for you. So pay attention to your, to your tools. Okay, so I was back in shape, ready to go out and cut some more or maybe get the chain sharpened. So in this chapter, let's talk about sharpening your chainsaw chain. So first thing I want to do, let's talk about the anatomy of the chainsaw chain. As you can see here in this side view, we have several different kinds of links. We have what's called a drive link, and this is the part that fits down in the slot of your, of your chainsaw. We have a cutter head, which is where the actual blade part is, and then we have the rivet links that hold the different types of links together. Now the top view, this is a really old, old style chainsaw. This one has what's called uh, a scoring head and these were, were used on very, very large saws because you actually make a little bit of a, a score in the wood for the corner of the, um, um, the cutter head to move through. Now we talk about chainsaw chains according to the size characteristics uh, of the chain. A, cha a, saw will, uh, a chainsaw will be characterized by what's called its pitch, its gauge, and the type of cutter. Well, the pitch is the distance from this rivet to that rivet divided by two. How that came about, I have no idea, but it's a standard measurement. So your chain will be uh, for a certain pitch, which is, is dictated by parts of your saw. Uh, the gauge, which is the width of the tang, uh, which matches the width of the groove in your bar, and then the cutter head. And the cutter heads uh, vary by application. So uh, a chain, now I've always used steel saws. Husqvarna's great. There are a lot of other pretty good chain saws, but if you go to, to get a chain for a steel saw, it will have two numbers. In the case of mine, uh, a two, which means this is a 0.325 gauge. Uh, a 6, which means this is a um, 063, uh, uh, let's see, the 3 is a, a uh, the pitch, the 0.325 pitch, the gauge is a 6, a 0.063, um, then it has the code for the cutter heads, and then 81, which is the number of links in the entire chain, and your, your saw will the manufacturer will tell you what sort of chain you need uh, to uh, actually fit that blade for optimum use. Now, talking about chainsaw blades, we, we really need to mention that there are a couple of major categories of chain. This has to do with kickback. Uh, kickback is when a saw catches in the wood and comes back up out of the uh, up out of the knot, you know, uh, up out of the cut, and this is one of the most frequent ways of, uh, frequent causes of accidents with chainsaw use, which is why you never actually stand over your chainsaw blade like that. You always stand off to the side. Do that again. Kickback is the reason that you never stand directly over your blade. You always stand off at the side. Because if that does kick back and come back out, this is where it's going to go. And this is where you don't want your head. We'll talk more about kickback when we, when we, we do some, um, some things on chainsaw safety. But the anti-kickback chains are characterized by a second um, little handle. Now this is a, I, I like this picture because the, the, the anti-kickback is very clearly set out. Whereas if you look at um, like the still chain, you can see it in there, but it's not as clear. What happens is the anti-kickback provides additional friction. So that safety issue is why um, 
It doesn't kick back as frequently. It's less prone to kick back than the standard chain. We see we've just got our depth gauge and our cutter uh, without the, the anti-kickback notch. Um, this chain will cut more easily and cleaner and actually longer over the course of a day. This one is safer. If you're new to chainsaws, definitely go for the low kickback, uh, the low kickback chains. The types of teeth on a chainsaw vary again by the application. Most, Most chainsaws will what's, what have what's called a round tooth, round grind. That means that the area under the, the top plate of the cutting edge is round. And the area in front of the, the cutting plate is also round. Okay? So you've got round tooth, round grind. As you can see, this is going to be very nice for uh, round files. A square tooth round grind uh, is another variety. You find these on uh, ripping chains very often and um, occasionally on skip tooth chains. Skip tooth will have a round tooth um, round grind and there's also such thing as a square grind where this area below the cutting edge is much closer to square. As I said, the, the round tooth round grind is what you're going to find on the vast majority of chains except for the very special use chains like the ripping chain and there's some harvesting chains, there's some um, emergency use chains that will have uh, the square tooth because that is an aggressive cutting edge. Yeah. We're going to talk about sharpening chains and all of the, the chain sharpening, regardless of how you're going to do it, is going to do the same thing. You're going to file away the area under the top plate angle and you can't see it real well in here but there's an angle in that cutter going in that direction. So you want your, your file abutting directly onto the top plate and when you sharpen, regardless of how you sharpen, except for the, the, uh, uh, the plate sharpeners we're going to see a little bit later, you're always going to wind up sharpening to the outside of the saw. So that direction, here out, never back, always out. So a question that comes up every now and then is when do you know that a chain is done? Um, if you look at the shape of the cutter heads with time, a new cutter head, and this is a, a, square, uh, a square cutter round front, will look like that. When you sharpen it properly, what you're doing is you're taking away the bottom of that rounded area in front of the cutter head. And when you're done, you've got so little left of the actual top plate that you can't really sharpen it again. How do you know if you're sharpening incorrectly? Well, one of the most common errors is not having your file completely centered or completely bottomed out in the round before uh, the cutter head. And what happens is you wind up filing away the face in front of the cutter head so that eventually as you know and as you sharpen this your cutter cutter head gets the cutter blade gets smaller eventually you get to the point where this area in front of that you this plateau that you've made is actually about as high as the as the cutter so that tooth is not going to cut worth a darn whereas this one although it's been sharpened just as many times you've still got the open access to the face of the cutter and it's going to give you a nice a nice sharp chain. How do you know when to throw your chain away? Um, by the time before the saw gets to this point, the blade gets to this point, you really ought to dump it. Um, maybe at about there. When you've reduced the size of your cutter top plate by 50%, it's time to start looking for another. Okay. All right, so looking at, a, looking at our, our chain here, first of all, this is a chain that is going to need to be disposed of pretty soon. If you notice the difference in the size of the cutter bases, this is one way that you know that you're not sharpening your chain correctly when you see a difference in the size of the cutters on the two faces of the saw. Now, regardless of how we're going to start sharpen the chain, what we're doing is basically is going to be moving a file like that
to sharpen the edge right here. And on this side I can see it's now nice, bright, and shiny. The other, one of the things you want to keep in mind is that you always want to put the same number of strokes onto all of the teeth of your chain. So, same number of strokes, the chain needs to be under tension, so if you're sharpening on the saw, make sure that your brake is set so that the chain can't move like this, and actually adjust the tension up so that it's held in place in the groove of the bar. All the chainsaw sharpening techniques I'm going to show you are basically variations on that same thing. Moving the, moving the, the, the file so that the, the cutter head is, is not above the top of the file, moving it through in a repetitive motion. Okay, let's talk about how you sharpen a, a, a chainsaw chain. General things about sharpening the, the chain. Um, you can sharpen it on the, on the bar itself, or as I'll show you in a little bit, you can sharpen it off of the bar. When you sharpen the chainsaw, the, the chain brake should always be on so that the chain can't be moved in that direction. And it's a good idea to, to adjust the tension up just a little bit, since you have to move it. You, know, you don't want it too tight. But you want the chain fixed in the slot as close as it can. So how do we sharpen it? Oh, we've got it fixed. We've got the brake locked, we've got the tension up, and as I said, remember, we're going to be sharpening by taking uh, from the, uh, the low point to the high point and grinding that edge right there. That was four strokes and it's nice and bright and shiny. You want to put the same number of strokes or the same amount of time onto each link. The way you would do this from the beginning, you would mount it, if you're going to do it on the bar or off the bar, you mark the first chain length that you're going to sharpen. The edge of the, uh, the, edge of the link, uh, the edge of the cutting edge, is about a 30 degree angle. That's the angle you want to follow with your file. It's always better to use two hands. Moving on to the next one on this side. It doesn't take a lot. These, these files are very sharp, little rat tail files. And when you set it in there, you know you're in the right spot if the top third or so of the file is above the plane of the of the file right here. You never want that file to disappear into the into the, the round below. You always want it just a little bit above. That way it sharpens the underside as well as the, the leading edge. They're very good, very high quality steel. You can see they, they hold the grits, but they do wear out. So don't buy a file and expect it to last forever. Clean it, um, a little a wire brush, just to brush the bristles, just to brush the um, the cuttings out of the file, and they'll last you for quite a while. Now there are other ways to do a hand sharpening. There, um, I want to show you this one. That, uh, this is from Still, and it combines a lot of things. Now if you can see, there are two round files and one flat file. The flat file is to deal with the depth gauge. As the chain goes through the wood, the depth gauge stops the, 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 the blade from going any further through the wood while the, the, um, the cutting tooth cuts it. But as you sharpen your, your cutting tooth back, you need to be able to adjust the heights of the depth gauges. And you would do this normally with one of these, a depth gauge um, tool and you just set that so that it backs up right onto the tooth and with a flat file you file the depth gauge and what that does is it sets this a fixed distance below the cutting edge of that. That works fine. 
This does them both at the same time. The flat file takes care of the, of the, um, um, the depth gauge. The round file adjusts the, uh, actually sharpens the tooth. And the way it works is you look on the back, you find the image of the tooth you're going to sharpen. That is, the point is up here, the point is up here. You put it on such that the, the two marks on the bars here are parallel to the, um, uh, to the line of the, the saw bar. And it, it takes care of dimensioning the um, depth gauge as well as sharpening Well, sharpening them. Now, you can see on this one, maybe there's a little shiny spot. So that meant that depth gauge is a little too high. So how would we pursue here? Well, we would we started here. We would go as far down as we could on this one. We loosen the vise, take the brake off, put your finger on the last one you did, and move it so it's the the first one up here. Lock the brake up, lock the vise down, and keep going. Keep sharpening on one side until that one shows up again. Then you take the saw out, reverse it, and now we're ready to sharpen the two, the the uh, cutting heads on the other side. Put the um, the round file in. Five strokes. You can see we took off some, some metal on the, uh, the depth gauge also. You would then file, you know, repeat all these actions on that side, and your chain is sharp. Is that in the field, it's easier to put on a new chain than actually to sharpen it. So you find a bar that will, will take your chains and put it in your vise. And lock the vise down, a bungee, and a can of paint will do just fine. So now we're right back where we started from. We can take either um, our, our hand file. You know, so I'm only sharpening from the, the from the short point to the long point. And as you can see, we got a nice bright little gleam right there. What I would do then is have half a dozen chains. And just do all of them right like this at one time, put them back in their boxes, put them back in my saw box. And um, you know, I would have, I have fresh chains in the field with me. This is the Harbor Freight Chainsaw Sharpener. Now, if you look at other machines that look just like this, they will cost anywhere from $150 to $400. This one is about $35, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little less. And it uses a rounded sharpening wheel. Now remember we're cutting not a square corner, but a rounded corner inside here. Uh, the way this sets up, you have a, a, uh, a rotation gauge on the base. The chain fits into this module here. You have a rotator. And the way it's set up now, we're going to be sharpening the the teeth that have the low point here, the high point here. And as you can see, the blade is going to come down right into that and sharpen. And it works pretty well. Um, the other thing about it, you've got a, a gripper here that keeps the chain from moving, so it is immobilized very effectively.
Easy peasy. Now while you've got it in your um, holder, we're putting the edge right against that little lid. And filing across that way and they took off some metal. So that's one additional hand step, but it's it's really not, not that big a deal. Whether your edge is exactly correct is not as important as whether it's the same every time. The advantage of sharpening this way is that you're going to get pretty much the same edge every time you sharpen your chain. If you look at the, uh, the professionals, this is how they do it. Not with this machine, but with a machine that's not that different from this one. There are other mechanical sharpeners. This is one made by the Granberg Company, and it fits onto your, your bar through here with the, the chain uh, emerging up through here, and you then fasten it down so that the chain can still move, but the sharpener is not gonna move relative to the bar. I like this one because it's, it's easy to uh, get a very fine adjustment. You've got the right and left angles, you know, your 30 degree bar, bar angle or whatever your, your chain is, but also you can adjust up and down so that the cutter fits exactly under the lip of the cutting edge and you get a very precise sharpening and pop it in, done. Rotate the chain to the next one, done. And for those sessions where I'm going to sharpen six chains at one time, um, I like this one because you can also, once you're done, you can raise, raise your chain up. Um, it, it's, it's four digits. It's, it's 15 thousandths of an inch. And then run your chain back through again and flatten off all of the, uh, the depth gauges. Again, it's, it's a fixed dimension between the, the height of the, the cutting tooth and the height of the, uh, of the, of the gauge. So we've seen that, that, like everything else in wood turning, if you put two wood turners in a room, you'll get three opinions on anything. And they can go from really not very expensive to very expensive for the professional style models. The files work great. This thing, I think, is going to become a new favorite. Um, the Granberg, if I've got a lot of chains to do, uh, because it's, it's so quick to set up and run. And, you know, I, I, like I said, I've got my Harbor Freight, but there are common features to all of these methods of sharpening. One, they all sharpen um, basically from the, the low to the high side. Even the wheel comes in on the low and sharpens to the high. The chain needs to be under tension. You need to minimize the movement in the holder for the chain, regardless of how you're going to sharpen it. Um, the, the bicycle brake mechanism here works just fine. The clamp on the Granberg um, or the vise holding the chain in place, uh, if you're, uh, or the, or the, uh, uh, the chain lock on your saw if you're sharpening on the blade. You need to minimize the movement on the, uh, on the, on the chain. You need to give each tooth the same number of strokes and the same amount of time on the grinding wheel so that you wear them evenly both this way and that way. Uh, it, it's it's a, like sharpening anything else, it just takes practice. But as I said at the very beginning, a sharp, a sharp chainsaw chain makes your cutting easier, a whole lot safer, and a lot more fun. As I said, I have always used still products, and I, I continue to maybe out of habit, maybe because they've always done very well for me. But the Husqvarna saws are very good also. So the only question is, what do you like? And with that, We'll close it up and say thank you for your attention.